So welcome back to another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With, and today our with is Morris Berry. So Morris, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I've been a, an educator now since 1983, and uh, I've been involved directly in distance every year since 1992. And the, that year I became the province's first distance education instructor in physics and mathematics. In those days, even though we did not use the internet, uh, we were able to do synchronous, which means live instruction with our students using a device called a telewriter, and, and we did audio conferencing as well. Um, in 1998, I was part of a, a research group that, that looked into and developed um, AP courses for online. At the time, we, we did, and it was a struggle. I, I have to tell you, the internet is nowhere near where it is today. We did pull it off. And uh, we used WebCT at the time for, for our asynchronous component. And we used a combination of, of net meeting and meeting point for our synchronous. And did I mention we struggled? Because we did. <laughs> but the tools improved and we learned a few lessons. And in, in 2000, uh, Mike, this, that's when I started working directly with you uh, because that was the year we started implementing and developing the, the, the CDLI. And you were very much a part of that as well. And, and, I believe you remember we struggled then too. <laughs> but as in all things, I mean, what you do is you tackle a problem, you deal with it, you move on to the next one. You don't, you, you know, you 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 don't leave things out there. And so um, I continued in that role and retired from it in in 2013. But since then, I've been with Memorial University, and I, I serve in a somewhat similar role to this day. I I work with our student team. All right. So over the course of that time, you've had an opportunity to work with a lot of school leaders on implementing distance policies and, and distance practices in their schools. And obviously this school year, if we start up or not, um, is going to be a little bit different than most. So what advice would you give to school leaders on either finishing out this school year or starting the next school year, depending upon what happens in their jurisdiction to uh, accommodate some of the uniqueness of the way this school year has gone? Sure. So I'll give you a couple of principles. Look, number one, you have to think system. Um, what, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a lot of heroic individual efforts. And, and that does not constitute a proper solution. What we need are instructors and students with tools that they know how to use and tools that are supported. Now, I'm not telling you which tools to use. I'm just telling you that as a leader, you have to ensure that it's system-wide and that people are being supported. Um, pick the tool for the job. You know, um, don't just use a tool because people have, have been talking about it. For example, you will hear of a number of free tools, which I won't mention right now, that, that, that are getting a lot of talk. Well, I mean, free tools often work very well, but as we probably are reading, um, they come with compromises. Number, number one being security. You know, you, you have no guarantee that, that your students' rights of individuality and, and security are being met here. So I mean, my principle has always been that if I didn't pay for it, in money, I'm going to pay for it some other way, and and I'm likely going to pay for it by either losing quality or more likely losing my students' right to privacy. So, look at it. What, what do you need to do with your students? I mean, for 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 what we use, uh, we found that 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 a synchronous tool, for example, ones today like Blackboard Collaborate work very well. Um, I'm not saying it's not without its trouble. But it gives you just about every tool that you like. And, and, a, and a bit of an upstart now, uh, which partners with uh, Brainspace slash Desire to Learn called Bongo Rooms. I don't like the name very much. The tool is pretty good. It just runs right straight in the browser. It works pretty well. Um, try these out. I mean, you're, you're going to wind up paying money for them, but have a go in them first because maybe there's something that you'd actually like. Um, just shift the parents for a moment. Okay. Um, the first thing I'm noticing is that when I when I look in the popular press, what often constitutes education at home is what we often refer to as drill and kill. You know, and, and I'm not knocking for a minute the need to memorize your timetables. What I am saying is that that's kind of trivial. And and most students, if if, if you sit them down, 
they can knock them down in two or three days. Now, what are you going to do with the rest of your time? Uh, be, because because simply rote memorization is, is not is not education. It's simple training, and it's not that useful to us. So so maybe as educational leaders, it might be best if we actually start talking directly to our parents. So it's like yes, let's let's keep the conversation going with our students. But let's talk to our parents and let our parents know what our expectations are as, as teacher leaders as well for them at home, because there's all kinds of, of interesting roles. Um, the last two things, see, I'm keeping it for five minutes, Mike. The last two things I want to say is, is you have to be creative here. Um, we don't have to roll out every single thing. Like, for example, if we're opening schools, no one says we have to open all our schools to all our students at once. You know, maybe we'll choose to open our students on a limited basis, starting first with our students who don't have internet. You know, because we, we can we can keep a smaller number of students separated, and and we can maybe address the equity issue that way, or students who are on IEPs, because it it could well be that they're not being served at home at all. Well, maybe they should be a priority if we're going to start trickling back rather than opening the floodgates and letting everybody in. Now, last, the last word I want to say is if there's one thing I know about education, only one thing that, that I want to leave you with, that education is about the relationships. It's, we generally make it about the content. And in fact, we go a little further and make it about the evaluation of content. But yes, that's important. But the necessary component that we have to start with is relationships. And at this time, let's not let that. Now, you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, to take us out, we know that with pandemics, there's often second and third waves that come through. Um, there may be local areas that get hit with a, uh, you know, a spike. And um, so we may see the need for the system or parts of the system to shut down again next year. And to prevent sort of the scramble that and, and panic, if you will, that we experienced this year. Are there anything that school leaders can be doing over the next, the rest of this school year, at the beginning of next school year, that would make a transition back to this kind of environment a little less chaotic than what it was this time? Yes, let's start with a guiding principle. Whatever we start, we feel. Let's start. If we're going to bring children back to school in September, we have to be able to finish what we started. So, so if we're going to open those schools in September, we have to have a plan B. We can't just go in there and wait for something to happen. We have to have the plan B rolled into place. Now, school year, the last time I checked was far from over. This is a great opportunity to support our teachers as they learn these new tools. This is a great time to do it. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Morse. This has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, and today the with has been Morris Berry. Thanks, Mike.